Hi everybody. Well, like I said, I'm going to try to put a brief video together about how I design uh, the planes and stuff and um, just share with you what it takes to create some of the projects that I've made. One of the things that uh, I'm a little bit touchy on is I've had people reach out and say to me that I'm not a designer. And I, I don't know what their definition of a designer is. And really it doesn't matter to me. I just like to create things. It's just some people say that there's engineers and there's designers. But to me, uh, it's the um, function and the form of what you're trying to do. So if you design something that doesn't work, what's the point? And I know many engineers that I think are far better designers than me. And they are. They're full-blown engineers. They could be an MEP engineer, a structural engineer. They've been around it and they've done it so many times that they know how to make it function. So somewhere between the artistry and the functionality, I guess people want to call themselves designers. But what I'm going to try to do is interface some software with this video so you can actually see what I'm doing on my screen. So uh, hopefully over here in the screen you will see uh, what my desktop looks like as I walk through some of this, okay? So I hope you enjoy this. So what I'm going to start with first here is uh, essentially I'm going to drag in the software I'm using my AutoCAD program and if this is all working right you will see uh, hopefully my AutoCAD uh, now so what I'm going to start with on the uh, AutoCAD is just talking about uh, how I come up with some of the designs that I've done and how they work and uh, just essentially, I'm going to use the C-130. Now, keep in mind, when I start on a project with like the C-130, what I do is I just take a regular scale fuselage off the Internet, and I will draw a line down the middle of it as basically uh, what I call my water line, which that's what they call it in real life when they build an airplane. I'm not sure why they call it water line. And then I pick a uh, datum, which is sometimes one inch in front of the front of the nose okay ahead of the nose so I then will divide the fuselage in, into increments that will be blown up when I expand the CAD drawing to be whatever scale I want the airplane so simply by taking your calipers and measuring what the height of each of these are you can then go into your AutoCAD and you can select points off of that uh, waterline to show where that would be. So drawing a fuselage in, in AutoCAD, once you've played with AutoCAD, is not hard at all. Okay, it's really not. So I'm going to go back to the AutoCAD for a second. And I, you know, AutoCAD to me, and now this is called IntelliCAD. This is something I got about uh, 12 years ago when I needed to help a consultant friend of mine do one-line riser diagram. So I taught myself how to do AutoCAD. So essentially, in AutoCAD, you know, you've got all your different ways to draw lines. You can draw all your circles, you can just do all kinds of things. And if you've never done AutoCAD, I would just say, just go out and get, uh, there's a uh, software right here, hopefully you're seeing that called DraftSite. It's free, download it. It's a great AutoCAD program. Uh, IntelliCAD is virtually the same, I just use this because I started with it earlier. The only reason I ever use DraftSite is sometimes if I have like AutoCAD 14, uh, or newer, my uh, IntelliCAD won't open it. So I go back and use my um, uh, draft site to open it, and then I save it to an older version of AutoCAD. So we'll get back to this now. So just learn how to draw your objects. So then once you go into um, the software, you know, you'll draw your line, and then what you'll do is incrementally, as you're going down your fuselage lines here from whatever you downloaded from the internet. Now find a scale drawing. They're all over the internet. Just find something scale. And then you'll go into your AutoCAD. Well, hang on. And we're back. Basically I have two 1000 watt light bulbs in here off old uh, um, film equipment I have to try to get the foot candles up in here so this is brighter in my office. And evidently the um, paint baking in on the barn door set off my fire alarm down here. I have four fire alarms down here, so I'm just a little bit paranoid about my shop ever having a fire. So we'll get back to this now. So sorry for that little intrusion. 
So basically, as you're uh, following along here, you'll see that um, basically this is just drawing point by point. So if I ended up with, uh, I can't remember how many uh, bulkheads I ended up with. So I ended up with 36 bulkheads, and each bulkhead is... If I remember right, and I'm not going to even guess, but yeah, about yeah three about three inches, three inches on center. So I broke this fuselage up because I knew it was going to be around 100 and I think 140 inches. I can't remember right now. Isn't that horrible? Been working on this plane for four years. And I can't even remember how long it is. 117 inches long. Well, 118. So I divided that into three inch sections over most of it, but in the nose where you get into a lot more angles and turns and stuff, you will want to make sure that you maybe divide that up by an inch. And basically, if you remember right when I built this, I cut all of this out of uh, styrofoam. So each one of these bulkhead lines was what gave me a way to contour the fuselage. So, okay, so hopefully that makes sense, okay? Now, when we get into some of the systems on the C-130, uh, like the wing, well actually I'm going to skip the wing for a minute because I've, i got another software that helps me do the wings. So let's go to the flap system for a minute. So on the flap system, if you remember, the real C-130 has Fowler flaps, which means it travels back and it tilts. Now, I had some guy on the internet tell me that it's a certain type of Fowler or whatever. I don't care. Everybody I know in aviation, if the, if the if it moves back and it tilts down, it's a flower. It's not it's not a split flap. So basically, if you look here, you're going to see that I have two tracks so that this will pivot. If I bring in my 3D software and I accidentally have the wrong one open, I've got my mosquito open. But let's go back to the flap system. So here we have. Uh, the flap system. Now this software here is called 3ds Max. It's, it's Max 5. It's a really old version of, of 3D software. But as I animate it here, you can see how the flap tracks and goes back. Now, the real C-130 has a steel track. I'm sorry, it has a, a, a track that's almost like a T-track that runs back the length and, and has an actual tight curve here so it will actually go down to 40 degrees. I'm only going down to approximately 25, 30 degrees but on a, on a model airplane that's plenty and plus I'm increasing about 200 square inches of wing by doing this too. So as you can see that's what that looks like. Now if you, you know the nice thing about doing this in 3D is uh, I can see if anything's going to rub up against each other or anything's going to touch each other. Um, uh, I just messed that up. So, um, hang on a minute. Let me get that back in perspective for you. So, as we zoom in here, you, you can actually see that I've got my servo in there and everything, the way it actually works. Okay? Now, I started all of that from CAD, believe it or not. I always draw, well, actually I draw it in pencil first, and I'll cut out the pieces, and I'll actually make the pieces move on the paper. Once I know the geometry is kind of close, I draw it in AutoCAD, and then I export it out of AutoCAD into the 3D software, and that way I know it's going to be exactly the scale that when I go to cut out the parts on my airplane. So I always draw it in AutoCAD because basically in 3D, I'm, I'm essentially building the airplane in 3D. Okay, I hardly ever create anything first in 3D. Um, so now we're going to get to the wing. And now nah, let's actually, let's do the nose gear first. I'm going to do the wing last. So on the nose gear, and every, every, anybody who's followed my videos understands how complicated this nose gear got. This was absolutely a nightmare uh, to design. And as you'll see here in the AutoCAD, I can get to the center of that. I'm able to look at some of the geometry, make sure how it works. Okay. And on some of these other parts, all I'm doing is looking for the swing of the um, geometry of the arms. I'm just wanting to make sure that anything that is going to rotate, it, it's 
it's actually going to end up and if you look here you can see the door open and close so on the left the doors close on the right the doors open if you see my geometry lines up with the same point here okay and that's how I know that that part is going to work same thing with this part here if I rotate that back you'll see it lines up perfectly with the door when it's open and when it's it's stored so I would then take this into 3D, make sure it works in 3D, and then I would start cutting out and making prototype parts and making sure it works. So, now we'll go into the wing. Wing is usually the most complicated, whoops, that's not the wing. I might have closed the wing. I did. So, let's go find the wing. Okay, so on the wing, one of the most important things to remember about the wing is... Uh, it has to be right or the plane's not going to be right. Your incidence has to be right. Your um, Everything on the wing has got to be right. So basically, believe it or not, everything you're looking at here was exported out of a program that I've fallen in love with called CompuFoil. And you can buy this online. And basically the nice thing about CompuFoil is you can pick your airfoil, you can set your incidences, you can go in and you know like generate a rib here, all you got to do is put in how long your wing's going to be, the number of spacing, um, I mean the number of ribs you want, or, or spacing. You can define your inboard and outboard panels. You can put the cord of how long the uh, airfoil is. Uh, you can pick your uh, airfoils out of a massive um, uh, database, and uh, it shows you all the different airfoils that you can use. Uh, most of the ones I use are NACA, uh, uh, I got to see it before I remember it, uh, NACA 8 I believe and then I modify it or I go to the 9, yeah, um, no 10. I start with the NACA uh, 010 and then I'll modify it. So basically I'll, I'll, I'll take this into uh, another part of this program and where I edit it and I'll pull up and create my own um, airfoil that I want from the most accurate drawings I can find of the real airplane but also because it's a model I want to create extra lift so I normally make it a little bit more of a flat bottom wing or more like a Clark Y wing so um, so right here you're seeing each and every rib now on my plane the way I design it is any place there's going to be a hard point like a flat track uh, the motor's going to mount because I use I do foam wings so all these ribs you're seeing are actually for hard points because this is a styrofoam wing that's covered with balsa and uh, uh, carbon fiber and fiberglass. If you want to see the straight on view, you can see the straight on view just like this. So what I wanted to do here is just show you pretty much how easy this is. Now a lot of stuff that I do, believe it or not, um, I will draw. Here's an example of me drawing what the receiver looks like in one of my aircraft. Okay, the reason I drew this is because when I create my list of where all the parts and pieces are going, I want to understand how many servos I'm bringing back to that receiver because I normally don't want to put more than two to three servos depending on how long the servo wire is per channel unless I'm using two receivers. Okay. So another software that I love is this center gravity es estimator. I can use the same datum lines that I created off the... Uh, off the, and I can't read these now, so let me just open the fuselage up again. Uh, let's see, is this the fuselage? Nope. And as you can tell, this wasn't very well rehearsed. So what I want to do is get the fuselage open. I don't think I closed it. Well, I'll just use this part. So basically, this is the front of the airplane, let's say. So you're going to start off with a datum line out here, and then you're going to measure back where all the components are going to be. Like the landing gear will have so many inches back. The motor will have so many inches back. The, the main gear will have so many inches back. Your batteries, everything will be referenced from a beginning data line. So if you notice here, I, I started at zero. Uh, my uh, receiver switches and stuff are at 3.3 uh, .3 inches. The nose gear is at 10.7 inches. The batteries... Um, 
for the gear and the receiver are 14.6 inches back and you can see I can put in my ounces here now that's going to change because I went to lipos on my main gear batteries to get weight out of the airplane uh, props and spinners motors ESCs everything that makes up this airplane all the way back to the horizontal stab will give me um, right now it shows that my estimated CG is actually forward of my uh, desired CG which I've never done in my life except once uh, I've never had a nose heavy airplane most of us know that we always end up a tail heavy airplane so right now since I'm not done with the airplane all these uh, numbers aren't accurate so uh, hopefully once I get all that inputted uh, you can put your target weight in this and then there's another program that will actually tell you what your plane is going to stall at so I hope all this makes a lot of sense to you. What I want to talk a little bit now about is just having to make some things that you you didn't think you're going to have to do. This is the uh, the Hummer that's going to be dropped from the C-130. Okay, I hope you can see this okay. But essentially, in the C-130, I have a little tube with a little door on it, and when the big doors and the ramp is open, that tube will move, and it's going to drop out this drogue chute. Okay, this drogue chute is going to then pull out I'm sorry have a ring connected to this this will be pulling in the air on a drogue okay then what will happen is when I flip the switch to the next uh, number I mean the next point th this parachute comes out and this is going to be the extraction parachutes there will be two of these this is what's going to pull the uh, the Hummer out of the plane if you notice right now my main chutes are here the worst thing that could ever happen is for the main parachutes to open while the Hummer is still in the airplane. Because if the main chutes ever get deployed and the Hummer got jammed, the C-130 will go boom. It will completely just crash, game over. So what I had to do was devise a way that until the C-130 comes out of the airplane, there's no way for it to release. So I made this arm under here that you can see. I'm going to let go of it in a minute. But when you release this arm, boom, so this arm has a hook in there. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, sorry about that. For some reason, my video just stopped again, so this day is not going perfect, but that's fine. I'm just using my Canon uh, EOS, and it must have thought that I left it running, so I don't know. But like I said, this arm is what released the main parachute, so it makes it impossible for the main parachute to ever open with the uh, cargo in the fuselage crashing my four-year project. Now, there's a lot of people that look at this stuff and they get scared of it, and they have that defeatist mentality where, oh, I can never do that. Um, there's nothing special about me. I've just been 15 years learning this stuff and never giving up and practicing and doing everything. Most of the time I start doing this stuff about 9 o'clock at night and finish about midnight. Um, or I do it some, you know, most of the time I'll do it on the weekends if I'm not doing family stuff. But all I can say is just try it. Pick it up. Go forward. Because I tell you, if you never start doing things, you're never going to figure out if you could do it or not. Okay, many people have that defeatist uh, capabilities like, I could never do that. You can do it. I, I guarantee you, there's nothing special about me. If, if I can do it, anybody can learn to do it. Okay, over the years, instead of... Uh, you know, spending my money on booze and women and all that stuff. I've bought machinery, lathes, mills, um, you know, all that stuff. Um, I just, I, I, over the years, just keep acquiring more and more knowledge and more and more equipment. Uh, most of the reason I'm able to build all this cool stuff is because the machinery I've bought. You know, I hand cut everything. I'm trying to afford a laser one day. I'm trying to afford a 3D printer. I'm trying to afford a, a CNC. I don't know if that's going to happen because I need to buy materials to build planes first and I can do it by hand. So I hope this wasn't boring. I, I want everybody to really think. I mean, if you were to take a C1, I mean, a, a, a GB, many people say this was the worst flying airplane in the world. Actually, Jim and Doolittle said it was one of the best flying airplanes in the world until you tried to go 300 mile an hour through a turn and pull seven Gs. Okay, as a racer and you pushed it to its limit, they, you know, it, it was like a race car. If you pushed it hard, it, it might crash. Actually, this was one of the greatest flying airplanes in the world. The problem with the model airplane version is, is that our motors don't weigh as much as that massive radial engine Jimmy Doolittle had in his, so we have to put a lot of weight in the nose. 
which increases the wing load, which makes GBs hard to land as, a, as an RC model airplane. So keep in mind when you take on a model that you're going to build is what materials are you going to use that we can use in model airplanes? The bigger the model airplane, cubed wing loading is worth its weight in gold. Forget what your, you know, your, your uh, ounces are per square foot, your, your, you know, what your wing loading is in ounces. Go to the cubed wing loading on the internet. There are computers everywhere. But as model airplanes get bigger, they're much, much, much easier to fly. I mean, my big MSL is 100 times easier to fly than a, um, one of these 40 size high wing load rocket ship airplanes. Okay, much easier to fly. So keep in mind when you take on a project, just decide you want to make it out of foam, you want to make it out of wood, you want to build it uh, uh, framed up, uh, and just get a cheap AutoCAD program. Draft site's free. Just start drawing cubes, squares. Uh, draw some wing ribs, print them out, cut them out of uh, balsa wood, almost like an old Gillows kit. Just, just do it. I, I mean, I, and I hate that uh, that phrase, but um, just don't give up. Okay, you can do this. Um, as normal, if you want to uh, email me, email me. Uh, reach out to me through my Facebook, and whatever you need, let me know. I try to help people. I do have a real job, which uh, takes an awful lot of my time. And uh, so I don't always immediately get back to you, but most of the times I do. And uh, one last thing, 90% of my C-130 I took from measurements actually from a plastic model and the actual Lockheed documents that I found on the internet. So while my C-130, when it's finished, you're going to notice the nacelles are a little bit fatter than the real one. It's to get the motors that I have to fit in the nacelle. Okay, so I don't build like at the level of people who go to the Masters or go to Top Gun. I don't build at that level of scale, the documentation, all that. I build a plane because I want it to be functional. I want the ramp doors to work. I want the gears to work. I want everything to work scale on it, the flaps. I build functional models. And uh, while a lot of people say that, you know, I should enter scale competitions, I've never needed the trophy. I've never wanted the trophy. Um, I just want to have fun with this hobby and I want other people to enjoy hopefully what I'm doing because um, I have a lot of people to reach out to me. So if you're going to build a model, uh, I mean a flying model, buy the plastic model, get the documentation off the internet, buy a cheap AutoCAD program and just start drawing. Just start drawing. And of course if you have any questions, let me know. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this made some sense. And um, I am trying to rush through it a little bit because my camera uh, only holds so many gigabytes at HD. And I'm trying to fit this in. So everybody have a wonderful day. And if you've got any questions, reach out to me. Thanks a lot. Go fly something, everybody. Take care.